Welcome to Happy Times and Places. My name's Toby Haydoke. I've asked my friends to choose a Doctor Who story or episode, and I have to guess their favourite things about it, all the time commentating and accentuating the positive, even on episodes you hate. Hi, my name's Chris. I'm an IT type from Yorkshire, and I've chosen a story that divides fandom like no other. Many fans loathe this story and consider it to be the worst Doctor Who ever made. I take the opposite view. Love and Monsters is one of the freshest, most original, thoughtful and fun Doctor Who stories ever, and actually one of the most critically acclaimed as well. In my mind, there is no better story. I first met Toby at a local group meeting on Doctor Who's 25th anniversary, which means we've been friends long enough that he should have a good idea of what I like about Love and Monsters. So... No pressure, Toby. Well, welcome, and thanks to my friend Chris for that introduction. I have thrown the schedule out of the window. Uh, I was supposed to, in terms of my planned releases, be watching Terminus right now, and I nearly did. I put I put it in the machine, and then I thought, there is something in the air, Uh Ladies, gentlemen, and other and everybody listening, um, Russell T. Davis has recently announced that he is taking the reins of Doctor Who again. In announcement that if you are if you saw it coming, you are a better person than I. Because if you told me the day before that it would happen, I would have gone <laughs> not a chance. Uh, so I'm I'm you know usually we've got an inkling of when a doctor's going to announce a regeneration. Um, I've always, I think, had an inkling. I didn't know it was going to be Jodie Whittaker, actually, but I think I've had an inkling of the other doctors, you know. Um, not much surprises us in this this day and age. Uh, that knocked me sideways. In fact, my, my phone pinged so much, I thought somebody had died. It's usually the reason my phone pings. Um... And I'd I'd already during lockdown um, uh, felt, you know, had, 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 had gone back to some Russell T Davis stuff because we had a guest in our house for a bit, who'd never seen Doctor Who, and we did the tweet along of Rose and our friend Mo, who'd never seen Doctor Who, said a thing I will always quote where I said, "What did you think of that?" And she said, "Well, it was different." And I said, "Different from what?" And she went, "Everything." Uh, and I thought that's a great description of Doctor Who. And she was anxious for more, so we watched quite a few. Um, and uh, and 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 it reminded me of how how much uh, what a wonderful world it was it was to be in when Doctor Who came back, and it was surprising and yet familiar. It was so successful. It did all the things that Doctor Who does that I love, and it also did a lot of things that. I didn't realise Doctor Who could do, and there were bits that that uh, that uh, were less to my taste. Interesting. Some of those things I've learned to love more now, actually. But also, uh, but certainly at the time, it was amazing. And then I think we started to take it for granted because I love I love Doctor Who, and I still watch Doctor Who. Um, but I think there was a certain point where, you know, because Stephen Moffat's episodes every year were great. So it was like, ah, now he's taken over. That's, you know, that's what we want. And I think we, you know, in our urge to sort of move forward and show that Doctor Who could carry on because there may be an anxiety of going, oh, but what when Russell doesn't want to do it anymore? Um, oh, and then Stephen Moffat takes over and ah, he takes it in different directions. And oh, he's cast, cast Matt Smith and turns out to be brilliant. And then Peter Capaldi and all the Doctor. Da, 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 da. Um, and then the, the brave new world of Chris Chimnall coming in and casting a female Doctor and that giving it a different perspective. Um, so it's, you know, it's still constantly had that thing of, of surprising. And so I haven't looked back that much. And during lockdown, I looked back and I went, God, Russell T. Davis was good. <laughs> oh, God, so good. And I, as I say, I'm not saying I hadn't thought he was good. It was just a great reminder to go, yeah, yeah, but he was good. It's like when you watch Genesis of the Daleks, as I've just done, and you go, well, I know this is great. Oh, but boy, it's great. Um, and so Chris has only just actually recorded his uh, entry for Love and Monsters. I have loads of these on the on the to-do list. But Love and Monsters is an interesting one, and it's very Russell T. Davis. And I don't want to watch Terminus. Uh, I th in fact, I might even do... 
two or three Russells in a in a row just because it's my podcast and I can and it's in the air and if you're listening to this not on Patreon you're probably going to be quite a few months down the line but this is what's happening now uh, and if if you you know if you want these freshly minted uh, go to my Patreon page um, and I'm not deliberately punishing you or withholding it but I've deliberately tried to, to tried to have a gap between. Um, when the patrons get these releases and, and when the non-patrons do, in order to, you know, lure some people who simply can't wait to hear me gas on like a whatever it is I am. Um, but look, uh, so I am going to uh, line up Love and Monster. The beauty of this is as well, I do have it on DVD over there, but I'm going to go on to BBC iPlayer, where I'm presuming that Doctor Who exists. Now, Chris, I didn't know we'd met at the 25th anniversary. I knew we'd... Chris is my sort of oldest sustained Doctor Who friend. Um, and I've, I've, I've got Doctor Who friends that I met before him, but I've, I've consistently kept in touch with Chris, um, you know, more than just via Facebook. We've seen each other socially, and Chris very kindly used to, you know, come and touch base when I was at university, when, when you know, a lot of people you sort of lose touch with. I'm now back in touch with because of Facebook and things like that. But, uh, but, um, but, but Chris, I think, has been pr- probably my longest sustained uh, Doctor Who pal what on earth was that oh i've just knocked something off the side of the sofa and scared myself witless i'm getting uh i'm getting a bit uh, uh i'm getting a bit uh, jumpy in my old age but this is not a jumpy story this is not a scary doctor who story so um it it's it's here to do a different job so let me find doctor who adventures in time and space and it is series Two, and it is between the Satan Pit, which I've done for this, and between Fear Her, which somebody has recorded. But I didn't want to watch that either. I wanted to watch Love and Monsters because I think it's, well, as Chris suggested, it's one that a lot of people hate. So let's see why. And let's see if Chris and I, as people that go back a long way and have a lot of the same taste in many things... Um, even though we're very different people and don't always, there are some... Anyway, let's see how we go. Love and Monsters. Uh, press play or select or whatever it is you want to do in three, two, one, go. Um, so mine's just loading. So there we go. And Now, so I was quite excited for this one because uh, the preview in Doc 2 magazine... Just by its order of the cast list, because it listed this extraordinary cast and, and had David Tennant and Billy Piper and Camille Kajuri, um quite low down on the cast list. And you go, oh, now why is that? And and I think we'd known that there was there were, there were going to be... Did we know there was going to be a Doctor Light episode? I think we, we must have... We must have done. And it was... That was a curious... Uh, possibility. That was a curious prospect... Um, but then they go, oh, and the cast is Peter Kay, a huge name, who I have quite a lot of history with. I was at his first ever gig. Uh, so that, that interested me. But I also knew that, that because Peter, I think, lobbied for this. He wrote and said, you know, I'm a Doctor Who fan, Dalek bred. And um, I think a lot of people meant that they think that Peter Kay is a Doctor Who fan. He's not one of it. I shouldn't think he's got Pyramids of Mars on DVD. But Peter Kay is very canny. And I think... Uh, well, he knew that if he asked to be in it, he would be in it because he's, uh, you know, he's a he's a national treasure and a hugely recognised comic. But he's also very astute, and uh, I think he knew uh, being being attached to this, um, you know, would, would would be a good mix. Uh, uh, you know, he was on the ball, uh, and that to, to me was quite an exciting thing. I think because you know he chooses his projects quite carefully. Um, uh, and then they go, oh, yeah, but also Mark Warren, who's, you know, a very well-known actor at this time. Um, uh, you know, and you go, oh, and you know, he can sort of pick and choose his projects. And he's at Hustle, and he's at Band of Brothers, and uh, uh, and he's a very, very, very good actor. Um, uh, and, and then the supporting cast, who we'll all meet to all people with stories to tell and, and good careers. And you suddenly go, this is a really interesting prospect. But I don't know, Love and Monsters? Uh, is, the, is it... Uh, is it 
Is it, is it the first ampersand in a Doctor Who title? Um, because I don't think tooth and is tooth and claw an ampersand. I'm not sure that it is. Um, again, you can look that up. But and and obviously, I think why some people can't take this is because it is. Uh, and Dan Zeff, the director, is a is a is a, is, a, is a director with experience of sitcom. Um, this you know this is stylistically different from Doctor. It's not just that. Rose and the Doctor are sort of support players. They are observed characters, and this Scooby-Doo thing, they know what they're doing here. This is deliberately silly. Now, uh, uh, is there a bit of unreliable narration going on? Because it is so slightly different stylistically from, from other Doctor Who. I, I can accept that that might be the case. I, I, I accept the fact that this story wants to tell itself in this way, that it's, uh, it, it, it's, it is slightly... Um, the comedy is slightly heightened. The whimsicality is more heightened than it would be um, if, if this story was to be told as a normal Doctor Who story from the point of view of the Doctor. And I think that's what makes it interesting. I, I, I think I think people that were of the sensibility that I had when I was a teenager watching Doctor Who where I took it so very, very seriously. Uh, and I understand that. And there's still a part of me that is like that. Um, but I, But I wouldn't, I didn't do that with this. I didn't, I was I was happy not to take it quite so seriously, uh, and actually, what, where it isn't serious and it is very funny, it also has a lot more heart. In, in it's almost like they buy the sentimentality of it um, because because it, it it loses its edge elsewhere, and I think that's you know I think that's stylistically very valid, and I and I think I think Nathan uh, it's and it's. Uh, not stereotypical casting, you know, because I, I think you could have cast somebody who was a bit like that. And I mean, I do get annoyed when geeks on television are very beautiful people, um, uh, because most of the geeks I know have slightly round tums uh, and you know don't don't go to the gym and, and don't don't have the best skin. And I include myself as one of all of those people. So sometimes I think I remember you know Xander in Buffy go. He's a, he's a, he's a, I know he later worked on a building site, but um, you know oh yeah he's he's the, he's the Ten Stone Weekly, he's the geek, and you'd look at him. He could, he could, he, he could serve as a battering ram on the storming of a castle. Um, but it's television. Um, uh, but but Mark Warren is a is a is an is an attractive man in decent shape. Um, but I I li I like his performance, and I and I like the sort of emotion there. Um, and and <laughs> I like <laughs> yeah. And again, you know, you wouldn't normally have in a Doctor Who story where somebody says they would just go, "I'm not to be confused with Elton John." But we have the clip, which just gives it a little bit of, you know, it's a slightly skewed way of telling the story. Oh, and of course. I think because the preview in Doctor Who magazine had had shown that there was going to be a few sort of callbacks, that that was quite exciting because again, what you don't get in the fact that this is a traditional Doctor Who alien invasion story for most of it, you you get the action by invoking, you know, the highlights of the past, even a bit of footage there from Rose actually, um, uh, to, to, you know, to, to give it all that, but also to feel like it's slightly sort of tying in all of Doctor Who's worlds as season two is is drawing to a close, which is going to be the you know the, the 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 leaving of Rose and you know the big the 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 the, the, the you know the sort of big the big bad in in, in it, or two big bads facing off, but in the build up to that, it's like we're drawing all the threads of of what Doctor Who has done for the previous two years, and Doctor Who is sort of looking at itself, but through the lens of this Zelig, this peripheral figure. Um, and I like that. I like the fact that Doctor Who uh, can do that. Um, and 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 this is you know this is an early blog. I like all of that. Uh, they, apparently, I, I remember from the commentary, it's one of the few things I remember, they said that, that they nearly cut the line about the rudimentary pulley sister and Julie Gardner asked for it to be put back in. Um, but I love that you're being brought into 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 Nath, uh, in Elton's world. Um, Peter Kay, there he is. Uh, and it's a, oh, it's a nice episode for Camille Kajuri as well. Uh, and you know it's all you already it's foreshadowing that this even though this is a bit of a gang show for a bit and it's it's quite sweet there is a there is a 
uh, inevitable sadness looming over it. Um, and we get the, you know, we, we know that Ursula is not going to go well for Ursula before we even meet her, I think, pretty much. Um, and we'll talk about that ending when, when we get to it. Is it yellow? And you know, I I I knew of ELO. I had them on top of the pops. But my you know my my music education always been whatsoever is around. And I, uh, I I'm I'm fairly fickle when it comes to music. If if something's played enough, I get it in my head and then I play it over and over again. I've got when I mean, I've got Spotify, I've got access to everything, and I probably listen to the same three Paul Heaton and Jackie Ad Jackie Abbott albums at the moment. Um, but I love Mr. Blue Sky, and I knew it as a song, but I wouldn't have probably been able to go that's ELO but of course once this was on I loved um, the contribution Mr Blue Sky makes to this episode and I wrote my show must say my Doctor Who scarf pretty much to Mr Blue Sky uh, be in the background to just to, to sort of get me in the get me in the zone and to, and to and to take me to the place that I wanted to be and to, to write that and it's no accident that that was the that was the music as people left the gig and it's it's played in the show as well um dr what <laughs> and oh shirley henderson's great isn't she uh it's such and again she's an a-list cast member this is cast the casting of this uh is absolutely i mean to the hilt um, Doctor Who could choose its actors pretty much at this point, and 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 I think you know ev everyone in their role uh, would would probably be the first choice for that for that part. And you almost would, probably thought they probably didn't even need to bother to audition anybody because they're all actors who who uh, you know had enough status that they could be offered the part. So I wonder if they even bothered to get anybody in to read, or if it was just like we want you, 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 and you, and they all went, yep. Um, and it's a lovely episode for them all, um, and it, and and it, and it and it has a lovely, um, uh, com you know, they, they they create this lovely community of oddballs, um, and again, I I so I, I, but of course we get that suggestion that yeah, it's not all going to go well for Ursula, and you need to see that in because it's you know the early parts of this story are quite low on dramatic incident so we've got to have the setting up of the little gang but there needs to be some sort of foreshadowing um but i love i love the um i i, I love i love the the collection of of, of oddballs I, and i think it's so affectionately done you know they're all people with something missing and i you know i i feel like that i feel that doctor who filled even fills a gap in my life that makes up from some of my other for want of a better word shortcomings but only shortcomings in 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 the sense of w things that other people find easy that i don't so much and i you know i i i i, I you know i think i know a lot of doctor who fans and we're a sort of mixture of loners by choice because we're a bit more comfortable with that but also you know also slightly lo lonely and slightly um you know I, I certainly didn't find a sort of gang that i i fitted into at school particularly i, I suppose at, at sixth form college there were all the, the drama lot because uh, we were we were all did acting and writing and stuff but i still uh, i still i don't know i still always felt slightly adrift uh chakademus and pliers um <laughs> and moya brady uh, there, I played her boyfriend in an episode of A and E once. Uh, so I've always had a bit of kinship with uh, with uh, Moya, even though we didn't we didn't actually share that many scenes together. I I came to get her at the end, um, uh, so we we only we only spent half a day together. But she was very very nice. Uh, and uh, uh, Simon Greenall, I've been at an audition with him for a for an advert, which I certainly didn't get. Um, uh, because, you know, everyone still has to audition for adverts. Um, and uh, he's, you know, very recognisable for being um, Michael in the Alan Partridge. I'm Alan Partridge, one of the great sitcoms, and Michael the Geordie, who's largely unintelligible, uh, who's a brilliant character. Um, 
And Catherine Drysdale, who has played uh, Kate in Taming the Shrew for the Royal Shakespeare Company, but she was well known uh, this time for being in uh, Two Pints of Lager and a Packet of Crisps, please, um, that my friend, <laughs> uh, a jobbing comedian by the name of Jason Manford, was the warm-up man for uh, at, the, at the time. <laughs> so, uh, but yes, the, and then Peter Kay, uh, who, as I say, I was at his first ever gig at the Buzz Club, in Manchester, it was a competition, City Life Comedian of the Year. Um, I was tipped to do okay. I was a young comedian, but I was doing all right. Uh, and I remember uh, the man in charge going, well, we've got we've got this tape from this guy called Peter Kay. It's just him giving a best man speech. Oh, I don't know what he's going to, you know, don't, 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 didn't think much of it. And of course, he went on and, and with that, that mixture of genuine uh, sort of down-to-earth um naturalism and and great comic timing and just a, a an indefinable presence as a comic um absolutely blew it away and the and and his trajectory just went zoom um and and here he comes in now interrupting them uh playing elo which musical friends of mine say that you know not nothing that they're doing matches with actually what was being played but i don't care but this is a this is great and you know they've cast a comedian as the villain it is supposed to be slightly heightened. You know, you could have cast a Shakespearean actor in this part, and and he's actually playing it very straight. But he has a comedian's energy and a comedian's baggage. You know, everybody knows who Peter Kay is, uh, and actually, what Peter Kay I don't think gets enough uh, credit for is he's a very versatile performer. He's brilliant at accents and things like that. Uh, he's a, he's a, he's he's a good actor. Um, I don't think the. I'm, don't think the eczema gag works um but that's okay um um and i almost wonder if he said eczema and then it's eczema he went i oh, know um <laughs> but i meant to say eczema it's a joke um uh but I, I i and i think this this wheeze that they have here of uh you know they're observing the doctor through the internet and i, I mean i i was glued to the internet for any scrap of information about Doctor Who coming up. I mean, my week was spent. You know, I would I would go into town early to see if Doctor Who magazine had come early. Uh, I still went and bought it from the shops. I still didn't have it on mail order. It was odd. Um, uh, but but this is this is very clever because it, it 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 even though they're not Doctor Who fans, they are. There are a community of oddballs who are brought together and actually whose life is given a bit of meaning and direction and comfort by Doctor Who, the person, not the TV series. And I called him Doctor Who deliberately there. Um, but also who, yeah, whose, whose experience of Doctor Who is to, is to go, you know, research to find little bits of clues, to, to try and dig into the internet to find little bits and bobs. It's, it's a, as well as being a story, it's a, it, is a, it is a great summary and telling of what it is to be a Doctor Who fan. But I also think it's, it's a really interesting uh, ad adventure. You, you know, it's a... I think we're, it's it's odd, isn't it, that we? What is it that the headmaster says in uh, in uh, a school reunion about the doctor? You know, for a for a radical, you can be very conservative, isn't he? he says something like that, doesn't he? And as Doctor Who fans, we sort of go, "Oh, it's that it's that flexible format, uh, and we're going to do a story in a different way." I hate what you're doing. <laughs> um, Gosh, she doesn't last. Bliss doesn't last long, does she? Oh, bless her. Uh, I th but she's brilliant. I think they're all great. Um, and again, you know, it, it, you, you have it's quite funny, isn't it? It's it's black humour, but it's quite funny that y you know he asks each one to stay behind in turn, and you hear the scream, and they seem oblivious to to, to, to this. But again, it's slightly heightened storytelling. It's slightly unreliable narrator. It's it's its own world that it's created, but that is true to itself stylistically. Uh, and you either embrace it, which I do, because it feels so different. It feels like Doctor Who is is doing stuff that fits in the Doctor Who universe, and yet is so fresh and different. But it's got such a heart, and is also funny. Um, but desperately sad underneath it, um, and that's that's uh, you know that's my experience of of Doctor Who. <laughs> um, 
uh, and I and I and I actually think, you know, the 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 idea that we had and this narration thing and zipping through all of that is great, um, but 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 the I but the idea that we have a, a you know a, a production schedule that means that your lead characters can't be in it. Ah, this is yes, go for it, Ursula. I love that, and I love the fact he gives a little bit of a smile. It's just go, oh, I quite like this, but she's she's superb. Um, and but remember, Peter, Peter Peter K here is so totally different from Brian Potter and uh, Max and Max and Paddy, you know. And he's always he's always got this, you know, he's very Bolton Peter, and he's always shot through with that 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 sort of genuine Northern working men's club kind of presence and 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 i think he's totally plausible as the sort of slightly bondy rp super villain and uh, and he looks great uh, uh i mean I, and I remember getting a lift to a gig i think with archie kelly we were doing something together who was in phoenix nights um, i mean i was in phoenix nights but very very briefly um and he was saying oh P peter had sent a message to go and i'm you know I'm, I'm playing the green monster today or something so that was quite exciting for me was that because although i wasn't in, in touch with peter i was never a, a mate of his we were just we just sort of worked together on the circuit and he came and did my club uh, even when he didn't need to so i was always grateful for that um but um he you know, he was one step removed, but I felt felt like I had a, I, you know, I certainly had a link with him. I certainly knew. Oh, there's Barney Harwood from uh, uh, from Blue Peter and Totally Doctor Who, because I know he filmed as an extra stay in the stripy hat. And Bella Emberg, and I think this is great where we do that. Oh, I'm looking for a needle in a haystack, and he shows his picture to Ella, Bella Emberg. And again, you can sort of do in this story where it's been set up that sort of comical things happen. Uh, well, that, isn't that more fun and this more joyous than than some interminable scenes of him having to go through London to find Jackie Tyler? It's 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 it's, it's got a breezy confidence about it that just goes. Well, come on. Would you? You did you really want five minutes of you know running through corridors, running you know running through tube stations, or do you want a f funny joke, with Bella Emberg? Uh, a bit more ELO, a bit of infectious. Yeah, of course you do. Fine. Now, is it likely? No, but in this world and in the in the tempo of this story, I th I think you've got to be hard-hearted uh, to 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 deny that that that's allowed in this universe that he's created today. And I was talking about Peter Kay and yeah, going that uh, uh, you know he's playing very much against against type. Um, for now, because of course he can. Oh, and of course, he plays a monster designed by Blue Peter. That's the whole thing as well. Um, gosh, this was a time when, <laughs> although, because of course, there have been designer monster competitions uh, uh, back in the 60s, the one with Patrick Troughton. Um, uh, but, but this you know that was something part of ancient history this is something that was done as part of the production of the show uh and uh you know s some young lad got to design a monster who i i, I seem to recall in the actual it's, it's either in the blue peter or the doctor confidential where he goes no it's supposed to be the size of a bus <laughs> go no it's just it's, it's well it's not it's it's the size of peter k um uh and and and, and because we don't have Rose and the Doctor, but we need some sort of familiar anchoring, I think there's it's a it's a genius ploy to pull Jackie Tyler into it because again that actually, you know she's she's largely a comic character or somebody that you know needs to be rescued or or, or get in the way or make things difficult. And here, what? we do is actually you start thinking oh he's having comic hijinks with with jackie but what is revealed is actually the price uh the price to other people of rose's adventuring uh and of those you know for those left behind and and that is you know that is a that is sophisticated you know that the, the russell t davis's stuff is so full of joy and and excitement and a verve for adventure but he he knows that there's another side to that coin and although he revels in it and embraces it 
He is, he is aware of the darkness. He's such a joyous, an infectiously joyous writer, and yet he knows uh, and isn't afraid of, of uh, uh, you know, of the, of the shade that is caused by all the light. Um, uh, so, uh, and he's gonna, he's gonna tell, uh, he's gonna tell uh, Moya Brady to stay behind, isn't he? And she's so sweet. She's got such a lovely energy. Br Bridget, yeah, Bridget, you stay behind. Oh. Uh, oh, and they had a burgeoning love affair. Oh. Oh, I think that's, I think that's so sad. I totally buy, I totally buy the, the slightly idiosyncratic little energy chemistry that they have, and that's a great shot. That's a great shot of the of the of the of the of the, of the lift barrier being pulled across her, as we know that we we will never see her again. And I, I and I, you know, and it does. Although these deaths are sort of comically dealt, there is an there is an underlying real sadness about it it's desperately sad um and i like it when sort of modern doctor who does what old doctor who couldn't really do and didn't really do is is have sort of musical montages and all of that sort of thing but i don't know many geeks with a washboard stomach but maybe that's just just me and i, and I love that it's got and she has to fancy him i suppose um i remember seeing somebody on a on a on a forum when I was foolish enough to uh, hang around those who who got so puritanical about Jackie Tyler um, here, sort of trying to seduce Elton and going she's she's a essentially saying she's a harlot and totally ignoring the fact that what she's doing is she's trying to find a connection because she is lonely. That is where judgmentalism. Uh, I think I think comes at the expense of humanity, and we have to be really careful of of that. And I I found that really odd because I'm very puritanical in many ways. I'm you know I'm I'm, I'm not one that's got a particularly sexually oriented sense of humour. I'm not one for bodily function sense of humour, and uh, uh, I, 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 programs about sex aren't particularly to my taste because I uh, I don't know. I just uh, uh, but. But this this is not what that is. This is well. It starts off as a slightly sort of comic interaction, and again, it's it, it's so it's what this does so brilliantly, is that it is is that it it plays itself like a sort of character comedy, but actually all of the comic interactions hide, and she's so funny. She's so funny, and oh, get off! What if a if a if a woman is not allowed to. Uh, uh, be physically forward to a man uh, when she's got when neither of them have got any uh, attachments uh, to have to to be uh, to be ports in a storm for each other. I think you've got to be pretty ungenerous to deny her that, especially as we know um, and as it's revealed. And oh, and it and it t totally derails their night and that lovely flirty thing that they have going on. And I think, and, and, and actually, and, and now that she's brought back down to earth, she doesn't go, oh, you know, I think a lesser writer would have just gone, yeah, just leave. I'm upset about my daughter. But she is actually, she goes, oh, I, oh, look, I'm so, I'm sorry. And, 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 and he gets to do the kind thing, go, damn it, you're my mate. We're going to have a Chinese. And then, of course, she felt, oh, and it's got the, it's got the music. It's got El Devo, which is as cheesy as anything. But under these circumstances, it, it's actually a really appropriate underscore, and it's very sweet. Um, oh, she does tell him to go, but in, not unkindly at all. But no, they go. He goes, no, we're not going to do this. You're, and I think, that, and I think all of this is really, really human, and and. And more than a sum of its parts, and that's what life is. That's what emotions are. That some things, uh, you know, robbed of context, like her being how she is with him, is is just a uh, you know a, a man eater seducing a slightly hapless guy. No, it's not. It's it's Jackie Tyler reaching out. Funny, lovely Jackie Tyler reaching out at a lonely moment, and him. Uh, 
and, and then it going wrong and and actually just producing a what sounds great chinese meal of, what is it and I, uh, a pizza yeah pizza and uh, uh and a bit of mr blue sky and yeah and then he comes back and and it's and it's ruined it uh but of course it, oh, it's made him it's made him see his love for for lovely lovely ursula um and i love this montage um again it's another montage uh, i think we need more musical montages in doctor who uh, <laughs> oh, and this is so sad. It's the injustice. It's because... It's because... She's wrong. Well, she's not wrong. She's right. And I, and I love... And I love... And again, it's, it's very Russell how he's... Uh, how she finds out. Not because she's suspicious of him. He's such... She thinks he's a nice man. Of course she does. That's lovely. I'll put, I'll put the money in your in your coat. Oh, and then he thinks it's nice saying I'm, I was looking for the doctor. Oh, it was never me. Oh God, it's heartbreaking. I think it's really, it's hard. It's really sophisticated. Uh, it shows a different side of Jackie, but it also actually shows a dark side of the doctor. Yeah, it's not, and actually I I find that interestingly is that sometimes i'll put a facebook status about something uh and somebody will immediately put underneath oh it's not like doctor who and you go can i just not have something that isn't about doctor who she does that really well and that's so sad it's especially because he's good uh and it's this sort of injustice although although as he says she was right it's so sad it's really well done but 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 that, but how it must feel as well when he says, "Oh, I was looking for the doctor." She's go, "Oh yeah, I know." Um, and and yeah, I do sometimes find myself resenting the doctor. Actually, even though I, you know, what are you going to do a podcast about Toby Doctor? Who, embrace the doctor, because um, that's I've got to say it's my USP. It's not a USP, is it? Loads of people podcast and write about Doctor Who, but as a comedian, I suppose. Uh, I could, you know, I'm interested in politics. I'm interested in current affairs. I do stand up, but, but it it gets noticed when I do Doctor Who. I'm the Doctor Who guy, um, and you know, I, 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 I like the way he says we go for a Chinese. That's right. It was then that he says the Chinese. I love the way it does that. If you want, <laughs> and I, I like this sort of. We're still we're still walking out, but Mr. Skinner, you can't come for the Chinese. <laughs> Um, but the ending of this had been oh so yeah, but but it is easy to resent the whole Doctor Who thing if you're not if you're not careful. Um, I mean, you know, ironic. I've on my because I I, I I you know I have Facebook friends who I've never met because I think well I don't want to cut myself off from people. I'll 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 chat to anybody. I, you know, I try and be nice. Um, and uh, and I've been putting a few things up about Coronation Street recently because I've. Uh, had, a, had a bit of luck uh, uh, to get a, a, a decent part in Coronation Street. My character's surname, by the way, is Dunford, uh, which I didn't choose, which is the surname of my friend Chris, who chose Love and Monsters. Um, uh, and that's just a massive coincidence. And, and Fergus is a bit nerdy, and Chris and I, uh, you know, we're, we're quite we're quite nerdy. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and Chris said, did, is that Dylan? name you've chosen deliberate i was like no honestly mate but um you know there's a, there's a nerdiness about 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 fergus that is not entirely unrelated to to chris and myself um but yeah so i've, I've put a few things occasionally put a thing on facebook that's that pertains to being in cory and almost immediately somebody's gone oh yeah is it like because of a doctor who thing and you go can i not have this without can it just be about me rather than be about Doctor Who? And it's it's almost like yeah, you're Facebook friends with me because you're interested in Doctor Who. You're not interested in me. <laughs> you wouldn't be interested in me if it wasn't for Doctor Who. And it's funny how you you have to be careful not to resent such things. <laughs> so I I make that observation uh, laughingly. He's reading the Daily Telegraph. Oh, I'm just, that's that can't be a mistake. Uh, now they showed this bit. Peter K was on Jonathan Ross, so they showed this bit on Jonathan Ross which sort of gave away 
well, it already it gave away the fact that all those characters were effectively dead, uh, which is which, which I think is a shame because. Um, uh, uh, and and I remember him going, oh, it should be called Doctor Wu this week, Peter, because because the Doctor's not really in it. Um, uh, but I thought I thought that was an odd choice of clip to use. But I suppose they wanted to talk about the the monster and the fact that it was the Blue Peter monster. But it, it did mean it, it's it's quite late in the story for a clip to be using to promote the show. Um, <laughs> that's quite. A f- that is quite a funny joke. Um, uh, didn't need the fart, um, uh, but that's just my taste. Um, uh, and I like, I, I like the fact that they, they can't, qu- they can't quite dis- decide the name, and the fact that it's called an absorber something, you know, which is a very Terry Nation thing. You know, if it's a, if it's, a, if it's a, if it's an arid planet, it's called Iridius. If it's an absorbing monster, it's called an absorber. Well, it's not going to have been christen that do you know what i mean that's like a sea devil i always think it's a bit silly when the sea devils call themselves sea devils when they're when they're named somebody else as a sea devil that's that's plausible so they've they've done that here they've sort of gone uh yeah he's called the absorber off but that's because he that's the moniker he sort of prefers of the one that they sort of struggle to call him um she's uh, i i like ursula's fire uh, oh, but I think it's so sad. I think that's so sad. Um, I remember Ian Levine getting very cross. He didn't like the line "tastes like chicken." You go, but that's. I think that's what people have said about about. Oh, I'm so sorry that you can't touch me. That's so heartbreaking. Uh, it's such a nifty negotiation between the comic and the heart wrenching um that it takes great skill to do that um and i can sort of understand why people might think it slightly jumps the shark when you have an alien from bolton charging around in a nappy uh but i i think i don't know i think it it kind of buys it and, and Peter Kay's giving it his all um oh and he, uh, but but the uh, I mean Peter Kay is the big guest star but 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 Mark Warren is the is the beating heart in this he's so good um I, I like the fact that she's still got her glasses on and again this this will be a deliberate uh decision you know there's a there's an archness to it um that is that is deliberate um but you just have to you just go along with it you just have to dive in uh and it's got and it's got enough genuine heart and i love the fact that actually what 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 what's what what makes it difficult for the monster at the end is that he is you know the fact that he ex- absorbs the people it's a bit like the Quatermass experiment actually is that the re- residing hu- the, the bits of humanity that re- reside within the beast uh, are actually what helps to defeat it and i love his his kind of he gives up you know um this looks like it was filmed in a cold morning i i actually love the fact that he gives up i completely buy that whereas you know doctor rose would fight to the bitter end this is just this is just poor old elton and that that little bit of body language he does as he bashes against the corrugated iron i think is so true and so real and 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 so in keeping with somebody who life has continually kicked, he's tried to be creative, he's tried to be cheerful, he's tried to be inventive, he's tried to create a group of friends, and yet life still kicks him to the extent that all his friends get absorbed and he's chased down an alleyway by a, snot, a, 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 a sumo snot monster from Bolton. Uh, and, I, I, and I think we've all known, we've all felt how Elton feels at this point. <laughs> it's such a great gag that she comes in and yells at him. <laughs> and he goes, you, you, and you're having a go at me. <laughs> Again, that is such a good joke. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, it's, it's got, it, it needs a big presence playing. Uh, actually, the absorber love is, is sort of quite trivial to this really in, in the, in in the in the long run but again that's a that that's a, a brilliant gag what's the what's the twin planet of rex Phalopatorius? Clom. that is that is funny that is just 
That is just funny use of syllables. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and it's yes, and I suppose it's right that uh, that Peter Kay uh, would re you know revert to his Bolton accent that we that we know him to have. Um, but yeah. Uh, as a as a as a yeah I, was, I have to be honest and say that as a you know as a working comic on the Manchester circuit I don't think lives that far away from Peter Kay it was, you know I was slightly rueful about the fact that you know it's a measure of our relative success that Peter Kay could write to Russell T Davies and go oh can I be in Doctor Who and it's a resounding yes uh, and uh, that's not a position that I I was or indeed am or have ever been in. Um, <laughs> and uh, also, usually, when, you know, when somebody says, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan, and you go, well, you're not, you're not really a fan, but it's, 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 you know, there are fans and there are fans. I'm not saying he didn't, he doesn't like Doctor Who. Of, of course he does, and I suspect he watched every episode of the new series, and I'd probably watched a few of the old ones, but, uh, but, but he's not a fan, <laughs> and that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, as I say, just a little bit rueful, and I think just because it was the first time, I think when it when it felt really close to home, actually, that this Doctor Who was being made, and oh, it was going to start to you know use people that that, that I knew, and I, I mean, there was, was a period a couple of years ago, and I thought, is there anybody in Rome that hasn't slept with my daughter and been in Doctor Who? And by Rome, I mean my uh, f phone contacts list. Um, but oh, now this is where it, it gets a little controversial for me. And do you know what? When when Russell T Davis came to Shirley's flat uh, to be interviewed by me for Who's Round, which I couldn't believe he did, and he did, and he gave me his whole day. And I was knackered because the weather fear had just come back, so I had fairly been to bed the night before. Uh, and I, I was gigging at the comedy store all weekend, and I'd got the kids. Oh, but anyway, uh, Russell T. Davis came around and gave me the most candid interview. Uh, he was even more candid when the when the the tape was off. But I had imagined talking to him about something because because this this was not a universally loved story, and there was a lots of chat on the internet of people getting very angry with Doctor Who for well, there's the the the. Uh, the, the gay agenda was talked of a lot uh, uh, by by lots of unnecessarily angry people. Always find it odd that um, people would think having gay people in, in a thing is an agenda. It uh, goes to show actually the necessity for uh, having gay characters in something so that it doesn't seem because essentially what you're saying if if there's only if there's something's got people that aren't like me in it. Um, it somehow got an agenda that's a that suggests that you've had far too many things going your way for far too very long that you you can't just accept the existence of of other people this is so sad um don't even know the, the name because the mother's not a credited performer because she's a she doesn't have any lines but but they sell that whole thing again with a little bit of montage a uh, little bit of music a little bit of home movie grading uh oh and it's so sad and it, and and you know, Doctor Doctor Who filled a a gap of uh, of of parentage for me. My dad was gone by the time I was four, uh, uh, and uh, I, you know, I think Doctor Who filled a gap in my in my life, um, a parental gap in my life. Uh, my dad was gone. I didn't particularly get on with my mum. I had to. I had to deep dive into something that made me feel safe, and it was Doctor Who. So that all appeals to me very much. Um, but, but, but when Russell came around, I wanted to address the gay agenda. That was going to be fairly easy for me because, um, you know, I had no issue with that. But I felt I felt I wanted to bring it up um, because that was the sort of talk of the forums, and it seems right if you're doing an interview with somebody to go get a bit Paxman and go. Well, some people are saying, and I'd got a few things that I didn't necessarily think were problems but i thought were worth raising with the man himself so it wasn't just a love-in because doc two confidential say was but and rightly so it was a, an electronic press kit it was it was supposed to be this you know this this was marvelous because we did this and that i thought well let's let's try and find some of the things that didn't work but but when i actually asked him that question and said was there anything you'd do differently he very much gave me a no no it was all you well know, it all worked and i thought oh that's oh that that's that's knocked me sideways a little bit um 
And I thought, well, OK, well, when we get to Love and Monsters, I will definitely ask him about this bit. I remember being overjoyed. There was a, 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 a an oral sex joke in Doc 2. I actually went on stage that night. Uh, I went, oh, no, not that night, but that week. And went, oh, they did it. And, and everyone went, yeah. And I was like, yeah. But actually, I, I, I'm not, I don't really like it. Um, I, for, I, I am slightly prudish, but, but I can accept things I don't like taste wise. I can accept things that aren't to my taste, but I don't, I think what I don't, and I wanted to bring this up with Russell and actually he's so disarming and so disarming is the word. I don't need any other word that I didn't, I chickened out. I wanted to bring up that I don't like this. I don't like Ursula in the slab because it doesn't make sense to me she would go mad she would not be happy um to be a sentient being stuck in a concrete block does not make you happy and so that to facilitate a blowjob joke um uh, is 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 not enough but of course it could be it's an unreliable narrator and he just wants to keep Ursula alive uh, and it's again in this great comic world we've created. It's a guy with a sentient paving slab as a friend, which is a funny idea. But it, it, but I certainly didn't feel that at the time. There was a nagging sense that this story that so many people were slagging off, I loved. It was a 10 out of 10 for me, but I didn't like the paving slab. I didn't buy the psychology of her in the paving slab. Um, but as we watch this, as we watch this now, uh, the unreliable rate narrator thing a appeals to me more and I love this final monologue and the w and the fact that the world is madder and darker and better is a is a great observation and a great philosophy and a, and what Elton says about stuff coming to bite the doctor and Rose who are who, you know who do seem to be having too much fun is a is a smart observation again about the the darkness that goes with the light I think it's a cleverer piece than people give it credit for and it's it's certainly it's well clever in terms of what it what it thinks about the world but also about what it does with doc two but i think i was so keen but there's part of me that also fancies myself to like the thing that other people don't like and i i think that's slightly performative differentiation from the crowd which i'm suspicious of because it's sort of like going yeah i like the stuff that uh, that other people don't like aren't i amazing um uh, and I'm 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 not sure I'm not sure I trust that I'm not sure that comes from a benign place. It it, it actually makes you like, there's a loftiness to it of distancing yourself from the crowd because I'm because I'm not, I'm just so different and better than them. Uh, I I think one has to be careful of that. Uh, but I certainly like the idea of liking the underdog as well. And uh, this was a this was a story I saw getting a lot of stick. But I genuinely, I do genuinely love it. But I, I really wanted to ask Russell about the paving slab and to talk to him about my nagging doubts about it. And interestingly, he, without doing anything, just him being in the room and the way that he approached answering the questions and the way that despite being so open and so kind and so funny and giving me so much time, uh, I, I, I felt... I felt I couldn't ask that question. Now, why? I'm not saying he deliberately emasculated me, but something about what he radiates and something about how he conducts himself meant, I don't want to ask this guy about the bit I didn't like. Like he's, he, I feel that that would be petty. And I don't think he wouldn't have taken the question. Uh, he, he, he seems perfectly capable of taking things on the nose without getting bitchy or tricky about it but what he so cleverly did was and again i don't even know if it was i don't think it was deliberate uh i didn't ask the question i didn't ask the question and i wanted to and i was going to <laughs> isn't that interesting and so you i so i think that's a sign of why he is you know such a so good at what he does um and i'm you know I worry maybe I'm sounding a little sycophantic, but I'm a, look, I'm a fan. I like his work. And having met him, I like him even more. I like the way he conducts himself. Uh, and not because, um, because, because I don't see all that, oh, it's marvellous as, as, as facile service stuff, surface stuff. I think he actually has an energy uh, and a creativity and a zeal and all of that joy that shines through his work that's actually really really important 
and, and the fact that he can do that whilst tackling dark subjects, not glossing over darkness, not not cheapening anything, uh, is is why he is so successful. And it and it do, but it does mean that occasionally I think some of the endings of the stories, um, it's more about that zest for storytelling than it necessarily is about tying together the 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 sci-fi things it's more about the sort of imagination or sometimes the thematic appositeness of the storytelling than about the watertight sci-fi but watertight sci-fi can be very very boring sometimes um and i and and as i say watching that this time round i'm more even more drawn to the unreliable nature so things the fact that it's created this slightly um heightened world where you can be a head in a paving slab living with a guy in a bed sit <laughs> because it's this slightly strange world born of grief born of grief but dealt with with good humor and storytelling that's what that's what elton is he's a good humored storyteller and that's what the great doctor who storytellers are doctor who is more to my taste than all other sci-fi because it has this great sense of humour that's 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 not cheap and never at the expense of of the adventure and the, the jeopardy and when it's at its best it's totally organic to the whole show and that's why I love Love and Monsters I think that's a terrific episode uh, and interestingly Chris wasn't the only person that chose it in fact somebody else chose it and then um, uh, and then somebody else chose it. And I said, oh, well, you can't have it because the, the, the first person's chosen it. But then the first person who chose it um, w wasn't then sure if they wanted to be doing Doctor Who fandom-related stuff, which I understand. Uh, and and C then Chris chose it. And I said, well, you can't because I've had, I already had two people chose it. And then Chris chose Midnight. Um, but then somebody I've been trying to get f for ages sort of jumped in. And instead of going, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, do the podcast send me available stories went uh i'm gonna do midnight if that's all right and i went oh so then i thought well the only thing because the other two uh, the only thing because the other two who who'd chosen love and monsters and or chosen another one because they couldn't do love and monsters, neither of them had, had had done the thing and i knew chris was telling me that he was about to deliver midnight i went to chris and said look please don't please tell me you haven't done midnight he said well i've i've watched it and chosen my things but i haven't recorded the thing and i went well i'll tell you what i don't suppose you could do love and monsters instead because somebody else is doing me midnight and he went no no fine uh, so he did his first choice love and monsters and then i lived in fear of midnight not arriving <laughs> but midnight has arrived so that worked out for the best so apologies to the two other people who would have liked to have done love and monsters but it just goes to show how a story that a lot of people really really don't don't like uh also um provokes a lot a lot of love from the people that do like it and you know what i think that's a sign of quality i think it's better it's well it's not a it's not a ph philosophy i preach uh i practice necessarily as well as i preach but i think it's better to really turn people off and really turn people on than sort of meander but as i get older i uh I uh, I have less taste for controversy and just want to get on with my life without without anybody hating me, which I think is slightly cowardly. But uh, uh, I feel a bit more vulnerable in my old age, and I and, and things do. If you know people saying unpleasant things does affect you, so so uh, I think I'm perhaps less bolder than once I was. Um, and the reason Russell T Davis is such a great writer is because he is bold, and you know fortune favors the bold, and certainly I think viewers are rewarded by the bold who don't hold back which means it doesn't necessarily always work but it, at least it sort of goes down fighting and i think in the case of love and monsters it does work um but, but equally i'm sympathetic to people for whom it is perhaps slightly too arch and and and, and too too comic i think that's missing missing actually the uh the different textures of it but I can understand why people people feel that way. Uh, Chris has given me five different things. I have to choose my five different things. I've been talking a lot. Uh, well, E L O, uh, Asta Rain, uh, 
supreme. Uh, I, th I think I think the musical accompaniments um, really really enhance the story. They really they are a joyous uh, aural landscape and backdrop to the whole thing. Um, I think Linda, I think the community, I think that that group of characters and the underlying yeah the, the community with a backdrop of sadness and a backdrop of loss and i do i'm afraid i do and i don't mean to be patronizing when i say this because i am in the group of people that i'm talking about but i i do feel that doc two fandom is made up of of people who've sometimes been excluded by the rest of society because either we weren't good at games or we were too bookish or we were just you know war you know clothes from oxfam i mean i'm all of those three are me i'm not saying all of those three are everybody but 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 the people who didn't perhaps feel they could quite fit in with the the more confident the more physically robust the more socially robust um and so i, I you know i think that i think that i think that's an important part of it that community but the community bonded by a little bit of with a little bit of sadness i think and this doesn't get said enough and so I think this is a good one to highlight it. The casting. Andy Pryor is a casting director. He's a, uh, uh, one of the industry's leading casting directors. He, he's done a lot of work with my partner's um, disability charity, which is a charity that is trying to uh, increase representation of disabled actors, artists, writers, directors. And he was the first casting director that jumped on board with that pretty pretty much and has been really helpful and got other casting directors on board and it's a genuine commitment he's genuinely committed i think to diverse casting as you know in all its shapes and forms um but aside from that which i think is vital and really important um and look at the the people like felicity jones and Kerry mulligan and people we had andrew garfield before they went stellar i think i think that casting of that particular adventure is ambitious because everyone you know has a profile but it's also it's also everybody is totally right everyone I, I, and I, I slightly move peter k to the side from this because that's sort of side casting and that comes out of somewhere somewhere else and it, i i think he does a a, a good job it works but it's a he's, he's slightly an island on his own in terms of the makeup of the of of the story but i think i think that that group of characters um so beautifully cast um and i think and i think you know biles we, we we can let the casting thing sort of filter into some of the happy times and places uh about uh many of the other stories where i won't because you could almost every week but uh i think i think it's important to give a shout out to to the way that doctor who uh, particularly in those early years when it came back when getting actors of of uh note was you know was really helpful to the show but then by this year when everybody wanted to be in it going well we can sort of we can be bold and pick and choose and, and make some really interesting choices and it meant that you know there was headline casting every week um great so i'll say the casting linda elo um jackie tyler i think what what russell does with jackie there and it gives camille kajuri a chance to do something slightly different you know play the character behind closed doors as it were away from being reactive to the doctor and rose and sometimes being a thorn in their side or comic relief uh or somebody to you know rescue from jeopardy um I think it gives her an extra dimension and a really true dimension for again a sort of slightly heightened comic character who is slightly heightened and slightly comic and yet absolutely true and that's the thing about great comedy is it comes sometimes is bigger than reality shakespearean acting is bigger than reality but because at the core of it is the truth it actually sort of heightens the way that the truth hits you as well and that's why you have performance that isn't all necessarily mumbly and naturalistic like like people talk um and why i why i'm really attracted to good acting because it is it is at its best it's 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 bigger than reality and yet it doesn't read as that it, because it doesn't read as over the top it reads as 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 
very communicative on a level that we identify with us without knocking us off, off, off our stride in terms of you know viewers going along with the reality of this but it also heightens the emotions and the insight into the characters that it is trying to communicate and Russell T Davis gives her brilliant brilliant jokes and a lot of heart uh, and 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 it's thematically important in terms of underlining the journey that the Rose and the Doctor are going on that for all their breezy adventuring it comes at a price and it comes with a dark side uh, and one more thing uh, five is I mean I, I just I mean I love I love the whole I do love the whole thing uh but is there a little is there a tiny little bit of texture that uh i mean i do like the way it says we're going for a chinese um i think i have to say elton pope the storyteller you know the, the the whole fact that the story is told from Elton's point of view, the fact that this is a totally different way of telling a Doctor Who story, and that you have essentially one of us this this sort of geeky character um, who's so cut through with sadness, but who you know whose life the Doctor makes lighter and darker, but so much better. Yeah. Okay, those are my five things. What are Chris's? So, the very first thing that I love about Love of Monsters is the use of non-linear storytelling. Up to this point, Doctor Who hadn't really done this very much, which is odd given that a good portion of the series' very first episode is given over to flashbacks. Whilst there were occasional flashbacks or forwards after then, Love of Monsters totally breaks the mould by being the first story to really embrace non-linear storytelling. Everything's told in flashback from Elton's present, mostly following a straight line, but with exceptions. By showing a scene that's actually from the middle of the story at the start, it helps to make a virtue of the fact that the story is Dr. Light. The audience isn't left hanging on for a first appearance of the Doctor and Rose, but Elton is placed right into the action with them and we see them through his eyes. That sets up the theme of the story being about how the Doctor impacts on regular people, and more importantly, since this is going to be the first time in 21st Century Who that the Doctor is not going to appear very much, it establishes Elton as the central character and encourages the audience to want to watch his story. The sprinkled in flashbacks to Elton's childhood set up his history with the Doctor, as well as adding a mystery to be solved. And then the teases of bits later in the story whet the appetite. It's an unusual structure for Doctor Who, and it makes the story even more engaging. Oh, he's good, isn't he? He's good. That's a really intelligent response. And I, yeah, it's not something I chose. I mean, I said the fact that it's told from Elton's point of view, but uh, no, Chris, uh, I think, beat, beat me to a pulp with that one. It's a great observation. Uh, I have nothing to add apart from my admiration for the observation and uh, it's the enunciation of it, the rendition of it. Uh, number two. My second thing, Love of Monsters is a love letter to fandom and an insightful observation of how fandom works. The heart of the story is how Elton's interest in the Doctor causes him to join up with a group of people with a similar interest, although they all have different ways in which they're drawn to the Doctor. Their shared enthusiasm leads to a bond between them. They discover other things that also unite them, and ultimately it leads to proper friendships and occasional romances. That's the story that many fans can relate to. Fans of many different things, not just Doctor Who. But having observed the light side of fandom, Russell T. Davis moves on to the toxic side. The way that some fan groups can be destroyed through the influence of a particularly controlling individual who tries to use the group to their own advantage. Yes, Victor Kennedy may well have been based on one particular fan, but that sort of personality often comes through in fan groups, manipulates people, creates rifts, and eventually drives people away or causes the whole group to break up. Admittedly, Victor's methods are a bit more in your face. Oh, very good. And it's interesting. I didn't talk about uh, uh, that. Um, and I don't know how how true it is that, that Victor's based on one fan in particular, who's somebody that I, you know, I have, have, have 
come across and and uh, who uh, you know is very important figure in in some of my early readings and understandings of the show so i'm not gonna I'm not gonna lob any stones in in levine's direction and i'm sympathetic to the fact that you know he seems to you know struggle struggle with his enjoyment of things sometimes and i i don't necessarily think that's always bred from malignancy on his part and uh, i you know i i i find anyone struggling to be happy um i have sympathy f towards um uh and you know i wish him i wish him well i don't i don't know him yeah i've met him a handful of times and communicated with him and uh, have have no beef um and i've you know i've seen yes how he behaves online sometimes and uh, and but i i think he's easy to mock as well and i don't like i don't like the mockery of anybody that's easy to mock um but i also know he can he can you know he, he can sometimes be the architect of his own downfall and i certainly know that there is a a toxicity within fandom i think i've i've now managed to get to the point where i i, I, I mean i think the secret is and i as i say i occasionally have had you know, fans communicate with me to Facebook saying, oh, so-and-so is doing this or this person. In fact, it's happened today where uh, a, a very nice chap on uh, on, on Twitter has been uh, has almost left Twitter because um, of, a, of a bit of a pile on and I uh, and very generously said that me saying nice things to him has, has made him not and I hope he doesn't because he's somebody that purely wants to bring joy and celebrate his enjoyment of Doc 2. But there are people out there who seem to want to sniff sniff out uh, uh uh you know any reason to to uh with a sort of puritanical zeal to um uh criticize some people's uh enjoyment or the manifestation of their enjoyment of the show I, why why do you give a monkeys how anybody else enjoys doctor who I enjoy it your way if you don't like how somebody else enjoys it that's fine you don't have to listen to what they say uh and what they how they enjoy doctor who doesn't is not going to impact the way the show goes and it does not need to impact your way of doing it and it's not just about doctor who because i have friends who are in who go to wwf forums and and various other things there's a particular sort of personality that has been i think particularly emboldened by the internet but i i i think you know i certainly seem to from my understanding of some of the early days of fandom there's you know those those figures loom large and they loom large in all sorts of walks of life and it can be upsetting um uh uh but uh it is it is very freeing to just go but um i'm well i'm i'm you know i i don't i'm not in, i just have no interest in those people um and you know you just have to happiness is a state of mind you know and you let and if you expose yourself to things that are going to upset you, you're going to get upset. And if you don't, you won't. Um, but yes, that's that's very interesting about the, the toxic side uh, of things. And I think it's sad. Uh, and of course, nobody thinks they're the baddies. And some of the more toxic people are, you know, conduct themselves because they believe they're rooting out malfeasance or evil or other people's wrong opinions. But it, uh, it yeah, it's... Uh, it's rather puritanical and unkind, I feel. But anyway, uh, and it, uh, but it's, it goes back to what you said about Russell T. Davis, as as Chris very well articulated there, shows the nice side uh, and then isn't afraid to go. But there's that comes with a price. Uh, it got the, you know, the malignancy. Um, I'm going to give myself a point for that because I sort of said Li Linda were you know were were an embodiment of the nice side of. Doc 2 fandom and I think it's a sign of me trying to accentuate the positive that uh, you know I then didn't go on to expand expand about the toxicity that I just have now in response to Chris whilst watching the episode because I was trying to take the positives I'm having that point number thing three. three is the Jackie sequence Camille Kaduri is only in Love and Monsters for about 10 minutes but what a 10 minutes they are you can hardly accuse RTD of making Jackie a subtle character but the broad humour fits in perfectly here. Elton's commentary on ingratiating himself into Jackie's life interplays beautifully with Jackie's not remotely subtle moves on Elton. Not that he picks up on her seduction techniques until she makes it more than blatantly obvious. It's a glorious comic sequence that then turns on the sixpence 
after Jackie's call from Rose, followed by her discovery of Elton's photo of Rose and the Doctor, showing her vulnerability as she admits how hard it is being the one left behind, and her pain at what she, with some justification, sees as Elton's betrayal of her. The whole sequence is superb, and gives Camille Kaduri her best material in her time in the series. Another point for the hatester. So it's 2-1, I would say. This is getting exciting. But also, I have to say, you know, I've chosen uh, contributors to this podcast. You know, they're often comedians, writers, actors, performers. So I've even chosen friends. Uh, well, I've chosen people who, who aren't really friends of mine. They're people I've sort of vaguely know, but who, you know, I'm aware bring with them a certain kudos because they're involved in, in you know, the arts in some way or they've done a thing or done this that. I asked Chris because he's an old mate and I thought well, that's a nice thing to do um, I have to say I think he's the most articulate and uh, um, considered advocate uh, for his story uh, as, as, as he could be I think he just goes to show actually you know don't uh, just because somebody is not a professional performer or professional writer uh, or uh, uh, or somebody involved in, in the creative world at all um, just goes to show Doctor Who fandom provokes, well, it, one, it attracts intelligent, thoughtful, creative people and it also inspires that insight, that creativity, that reveling in ideas and that's exactly what Chris is doing here and I think rising to the challenge and doing it brilliantly. I'm so glad I asked you, mate. Uh, I don't. I haven't seen Chris in in many years. We are, you know, we are, we 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 are in touch, uh, and he's always been very supportive of my uh, and anything that I've done. But again, because we're in touch by electronic means, it sometimes means you know you don't you don't meet in a basement and play ELO in the way that you once used to, and uh, this is making me yearn for that kind of contact. So, Love and Monsters continues to be instructive and inspiring. Uh, okay, Chris, number four. I'm feeling. I'm gonna. I'm feeling confident. This is where it all goes to <laughs> goes to poop. Number four. Thing four. The ensemble cast. I know it's a cop out, but the whole cast are great, and it wouldn't be fair to pick out just one. Obviously, Mark Warren is brilliant. He comes in as the lead actor for one week in someone else's show and makes it his own within seconds. Shirley Henderson is a national treasure and is always effortlessly wonderful. She's perfect as Ursula, putting over so many facets in a pretty short period of time in the episode. Scarily, she'll be 60 in a few years' time. I hope that someone thinks about casting her as the Doctor sooner rather than later. She would be amazing. Simon Greenall, Moya Brady and Catherine Drysdale all make great, relatable characters, and you really feel for each one as they go off to meet their absorber. And Peter Kay was the surprise package. He's excellent as Victor Kennedy. Whilst I can understand that not everyone likes quite how broad his portrayal is once he becomes the absorber of, I think he plays it just on the right side of the line. In any case, it works wonderfully in the context of Thing 5. Um, I think this, uh, isn't it wonderful that it's Love and Monsters? I think I've got three out of four, which means that, oh no, because there's a bonus thing. Well, I'm certainly going to tie, and I haven't done. No, there's not a bonus thing. There's not, because it's five. It's out of five. The last file is him plugging whatever thing he's plugging. Is it's his goodbye. I've done three out of five. So even if I don't get this next one, for the first time, <laughs> I think I've won. I'm quite emotional. I never expected to win any. And the fact that it's Love and Monsters, the fact that it's one of my 10 out of 10 because I sort of ignore the fact that I don't like the paving slab bit. Oh, I, because that's the thing, isn't it? Actually, if you choose to ignore, I have very few 10 out of 10 but Love and Monsters is a 10 out of 10 because of what it represents, even though it's got a bit in it, in it, in it I don't like. <laughs> but that's the key isn't it that's the key it's you can forgive it's like you know you forgive your football team even if they play badly because you love them um although so i forgive doctor who for doing stories i don't like but i forgive love and monsters for having a bit in it i don't like because of what it represents elsewhere it's a definite 10 out of 10 and the fact that this is the story 
whose sensibility was there when I was writing Moth Set, my Doctor Who scarf, which led from me being a jobbing comic on the circuit who had a couple of friends who liked Doctor Who. I knew people knew like Doctor Who, people who knew me on the, on, on the circuit um, knew that I liked Doctor Who, but I, you know, I, I wasn't known to the Doctor, the restoration team or the BBC or anybody, anybody um, uh, out in the world of Doctor Who. Uh, and and that you know that sh- that show's been good to me, and it wouldn't have been the show it was without you know, and 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 it's a show that's about the love for Doctor Who, but it's also about filling a gap. It's the show about Doctor Who filling the gap for the absence of my dad, which, which you know, and that's a, that's a theme that 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 I return to again and again when I write stuff. Was 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 definitely there, partially because of the the happy sadness. The, the the sort of heightened comedy melancholy are that pervaded love and monsters to the extent that I used uh, you know ELO. Um, so the fact that that's the story that I think I'm one with for the first time, and the fact that it's my old mate Chris as well, has tickled me pink. Now come on, Chris, choose ELO. Before I get to thing five, I'll give an honourable mention to two things that I nearly chose. One is the use of the music. Obviously, ELO's music is used in a really clever way, but also Murray Gold is on good form as always. The other is the final scene. I'll come back to the most notorious aspect of it in a moment or two, but Elton's summing up of the Doctor's effect on people and one of the best closing lines in the whole of Doctor Who are written and played beautifully. However, I'm only allowed five choices, so they have to go, and I'm sorry if you've chosen one or both of them, Toby. My actual final choice of things that I love about Lover Monsters is that it's up to you to work out how much is real and how much is the product of Elton's deranged imagination. When Toby interviewed Russell T Davies for Who's Round, Russell rejected the idea of Elton being an unreliable narrator. Well, Russell's always enjoyed being provocative and saying things that challenge assumptions. But if he really means that then, tough. Death of the author totally applies here. I mean... From the beginning, it's obvious that the images we see are the way that Elton perceives them, rather than the literal truth. His computer didn't really explode when he says that the internet went into meltdown. The Hoyts chase obviously wasn't like something from Scooby-Doo. And Victor Kennedy probably didn't change into a southern idea of a Coronation Street reject, with apologies to any Curry actors in the vicinity. Elton is entirely an unreliable narrator, And that means that the whole story is open for interpretation in a big way. By the time you get through to the end, is Ursula really living on in concrete form? Elton's gone through some pretty major traumas by then, so it's hardly a stretch to think that the Ursula slab might be the figment of Elton's broken mind trying to cope with his loss. As he's narrating the whole thing in retrospect, how much is what really happened and how much is in his mind? I have my ideas but I love that it's open to each viewer's interpretation. Chris, I love you. Um, and I'm, a, I'm late to the unreliable narrator party. I'd forgotten I even brought it up with Russell because I don't, I don't, I try not to listen back to any interviews I've done. I mean, just listening back to them to edit them makes me feel physically sick. Um, so I'd forgotten I'd brought up the unreliable narrator in the interview and I'd forgotten that Russell had rejected it. But I love Chris's, with with the boldness of Russell T. Davis's own storytelling, going, well, t- I don't care what you say. This is what I interpret uh, and makes a very convincing case because, of course, computers didn't explode because of the internet. Of course, the Scooby-Doo thing is, you know, is deliberately arch. I, I did say that. Um, but but the fact that that all ties in with the idea of the unreliable narrator, and you suspect, you know, his search for Jackie was probably a bit harder than that. Uh, I buy that. I buy that. I'm very eloquently argued and convincingly argued. Uh, so, yeah, so even though I didn't choose that, I'm having it. I like it. Um, but I think that leaves me at uh, at three two. I still think I have won, and uh, I know I I gave myself a couple of them slightly loosely based on. But but I'm I'm the narrator. I'm as reliable as uh, you want me to be, and I I th- I think I because sometimes I'm hard on, on myself on this. I think I have, I think I have, I've played pretty fair 
with this one. And of course, if you decide that I'm wrong, that's fine. There's not a league table anywhere. Um, but I'm taking this. I'm living. I'm living in this victory. What is Chris's uh, final thought and plug? As tradition dictates, I've got a plug for what I do in the Doctor Who world. I'm one of the organisers of the Top 3 tournament, which takes place annually from late March to November on the Gallifrey based forum. The tournament is a favourite story competition, possibly the oldest of its kind on the internet. It'll be celebrating its 20th anniversary in 2022. It's a simple format. Everyone who's taking part votes for their favourite three stories in a match. The top three go to the next round. And eventually, around 300 stories are narrowed down to the final half dozen. And on November the 23rd each year, the grand final finishes and the winner is revealed. It's good fun. And the more players, the merrier. So if you're into that sort of thing, you're very welcome to join us. You can find the tournament in the Games of Rassilon sub-forum of Gallifrey Base, which is at gallifreybase.com, or by following the links from Linktree, that's linktr.ee, forward slash Doctor Who Top 3 Tournament, with the number three instead of the word. Let us know that Happy Times and Places sent you. Oh! Well, that would be, that's like market research. Um, it is a great tournament. I haven't done it in, in nearly long enough. Uh, but a bit like revisiting the Russell T. Davis era, I, I feel the pull. To, and, and a bit like sort of uh, knocking heads with my old mate Chris. I've, 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 this has been a real exercise in nostalgia for me. I hope you haven't felt left out, but I'm sure you've got your own versions of this of this kind of nostalgia. Uh, I spent a lot of time on Gallifrey Base in uh in in in, in uh, during this time in in the show because it, it was where you realized uh you know uh, the worlds of fandom out there in all their different shapes sizes and yes occasional toxicity um and i used to do the top three tournament and of course would get furious because the ambassadors of death and the androids of tara and various stories that i adore in the same way that i adore love and monsters but that not everybody else seems to quite a, a, or not the majority of people uh, enjoy enough for them to be considered classics when I you know feel that they're amongst the best of their kind but also I think I wouldn't like it if all Doctor Who stories were like them that I, I love them f f for f often because they're stories that there's not quite another story like and if there'd been a season of stories like love and monsters i think they'd have paled same way if there's a season of stories that are, are sort of witty and bouncy and free uh, as androids of tara i'd be like no come on we need some darker ones with some more adventure that aren't quite as uh, as picture book you know if the, if 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 everything had been as um uh, you know, in the same, st I mean, season seven is a is a similar style, but I think I, th I think people don't uh, 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 are perhaps more impervious to ambassadors of death than the others, and they shouldn't be because ambassadors has so much to to recommend it. Um, and, and 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 so I think I'm even more of a steadfast advocate for those stories than say Genesis of the Daleks, which you know most people love and, and caves, um, caves Ranjazani. Um so, you know, that, that tournament, yes, would be fun to do, but also, you know, with the light comes the darkness, also infuriating because not everybody thinks the same as me. And of course, what I hope we realise is that it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's the beauty of it. And that's what means that if we're, you know, good friends and fans, we can sit around in the pub and enjoy those differences of opinion. And it doesn't mean you're bad and I'm good or vice versa. It, it, it gives us... That's what conversation is. That's what creativity is. It sparks different parts of our synapses. But what I also like is that turns out, you know, my longest running consistent Who fan friend and I, who are we are rather different people, um, different characters. We've both got a, an equally geeky seam running through us. Um, we actually, that's why we've been friends for a long time. We actually, we agreed on three of the five things. And in fact... We were, we were pretty close on, on the others as well. So I was right to choose. I was in an RTD mood because he is back. Uh, and uh, it's a reminder. Um, and and I, I've enjoyed sort of being Elton, Elton Pope and looking, looking back through my own lens uh, at something that provokes happy and sad thoughts and memories. Uh, emphasizes the importance of friendship emphasizes the importance of creativity 
emphasizes the importance of humor i think i think that's where some of the toxicity comes from is is people just forgetting to approach life even the darker parts of life with a sense of humor that's what separates us uh uh you know, that's what separates humanity from from everything else and certainly the, you know the malign uh is is a sense of humor about things even things that are desperately important to you and it's a reminder that Doctor Who and what Doctor Who brings to us and to our life is so much stranger and so much madder and so much darker and so much better. Thanks so much for listening to Happy Times and Places with me, Toby Haydock, and my special guest, Chris Dunford Kelk. Huge thanks to the patrons who make these podcasts possible, my Linda, who include Ruben Herfindahl, Peter Burns, Peter Harness, Rob Leonard, Stephen Moffat, not that one, Richard Straw, David, who I think wants to remain anonymous. If you're not hearing a surname and you want to, David, do let me know. I've sent you a message in your patron inbox. Uh, Jenny at Blue Box 99, Paul Carrington, Paul Cook, Peter Crocker, Rob Dawson, John Deere, Chris Dunford Kelk, Chris Bone, Jason Gorman, Siobhan Galichon, Ian Key, Joe Llewellyn, Darren Mackay, Barry Platt, Luke Atkins, Pete Adamson, Will Brooks, Rick Byatt, Alex Kapajoglu, Paul Carnahan, Andy Case, Richard Chalk, John Curley, Mark Dakin, John Elledge, Gary Gillett, James Gould, Lisa C. Greco, Hugh Davis. The music is by Dave Gates and the artwork by Dylan Patterson. Out now. All new episodes of Dick Dixon in the 21st century. It's a fuzzy, distorted blur, like watching BBC Two on the Isle of Wight. I can barely make out anything through the interference, just vague shapes moving up and down. Lieutenant Fox, can you use the computer to improve the picture quality? Of course, Admiral. It hadn't occurred to me to do that. That's why they made me Admiral. I think outside the box. Applying image enhancement. Warning. The distress signal you are about to see contains images of a graphic nature that some viewers may find disturbing. Oh dear. I hope this isn't another one of those situations where they've started eating each other. Dick Dixon and the Love Bug is available for purchase now from www.averagerobble.com. Well, uh, if you'd like to get together with me on Patreon and mime unconvincingly to ELO songs, that's not what we do. Uh, <laughs> you can sign up at patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydock. I actually didn't notice uh, about the miming until somebody pointed out to me. It absolutely worked absolutely fine for me. Uh, patreon.com forward slash Toby Haydock uh, is starts at three pounds per month. And if you sign up for a whole year, you get a 10% discount. Even on top of that, you get bonus material, early releases, uh, and a few other little goodies. And uh, the goodies start on the lowest tier. It's fairly egalitarian. So uh, do that if you fancy it. If you don't or can't, there's also the Kofi option where, you know, when you're passing, you can chuck me a couple of pennies if you're feeling flush or sorry for me. Uh, but look, I know that times are tough and uh, we're emerging from a global pandemic. I'm grateful that there's an audience out there for this stuff. But I would like to increase it because, you know, one wants one labours to be appreciated and relevant to as many people as possible. And people will only know about it if I climb up the algorithm ladder. And the only way that I can do that is if you leave five star reviews. Uh, well, five star ratings and then lots of lovely lines of nice reviews sending nice feedback about these podcasts, which have the umbrella title Toby Haydock's Time Travels uh, on iTunes or anywhere else. It just helps with the uh, the visibility and the circulation. And tell your friends and tell Cyberspace. Uh, Twitter has its own uh, account for these podcasts at Haydock Podcasts. And I am on at Toby Haydock. So go on, uh, do a circular social media and uh, drop some uh, honeyed words 
into the cyber lug holes of anybody you may think want to hear this nonsense. Do avail yourself of my comedy club, Excess Malarkey, which is in Manchester every Tuesday night at 8pm at The Breadshed. It's also monthly online the first Sunday of every month at twitch.tv forward slash Excess Malarkey. It's been going 24 years. Uh, it's highly regarded and gets fine comedians all glued together by me, uh, sometimes waving, sometimes drowning. Sun is shining in the sky. There ain't a cloud in sight. It's stopped raining. Everybody's in the play. And don't you know, it's a beautiful new day. Hey, hey. Oh, and hey, you with the pretty face. Welcome to the human race. Ha, <laughs> ha.